The topic that we're going to uh, conclude with is uh, around uh, what we can call uh, abstraction and language. So, so there is one question that, that in a way uh, resumes this, which is how does abstraction help us to understand the universe and how can we form new languages when standard forms fail? So I would like first to introduce uh, briefly my panel, and I think it would be great if each of you introduce yourself. I mean, Monica is already, w yes, introduced. So, um, and, and, and it's great that we are also concluding the, the, the panel uh, with Monica here. Uh, and um, I think, yeah. Um, I'm Haroon, Haroon Mirza, and um, I'm an artist, and I work with Jack here on uh, one of the installations. And I'm Jack, and I'm an artist, and I work with Haroon here on one of the installations. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Bauer, is this working? Uh, and I work with Seth on something upstairs. <laughs> Should we complete the symmetry? It's like a Mexican <laughs> wave. Seth doesn't Mexican know wave symmetry. I'll break the symmetry. Okay, so I, no, I'm, I, I'm Seth and I'm working with Diane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, and these two on the end. Oh, right <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It, <laughs> Super symmetry does exist. Recession. So, so, so uh, here there are two topics, abstraction and language, that in many ways cross paths. And, and, and it would be tricky, of course, to talk about that extensively in, in 30 minutes or 45 minutes. But I would like to uh, give a very brief overview, not only of uh, the works uh, of, of um, uh, Diane uh, and Seth and uh, Haroon and Jack, but also to give a little bit of an overview of, uh, of other um, 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 uh, works that have a, uh, a little bit to do with language, because it, this is a recurring topic, but it has been um, discussed and, and interpreted by, by the artists in the show in many ways. And I would like to start a little bit with, with, with a work that is in the foyer, uh, the, the work of Julieta Aranda, which is called Stealing uh, One's Own Corpse, an alternative set of uh, uh, footholds for an ascent into the dark. And this is the last part of a trilogy in which she is investigating the, the contemporary existential conditions underlining extra scientific circumstances that prevail around scientific and technological research. And here, Julieta focuses on the current state of humanism, but turning it into a more individualistic, um, human-centered perspective, extending it to um, exploitations and extractions through land and soil. And, and in the installation, if you go there, you will see uh, three large prints of, of a gene. And uh, while we were talking with uh, Julieta some days ago, while we, we were mounting the exhibition, we, we came to knew that uh, this was the uh, gene of uh, uh, something called uh, FOXP2, which uh, may uh, seem to be one of the genes that make it easier for human beings to transform new experiences into routine procedures. So it seems that, at least from what neuroscientists have found out, this gene mutation, uh, which arose from more than half a million years ago, may be key to humans' uni uh, unique ability to traduce and understand language, thus transforming experiences into hearing, uh, let's say, for example, a word pen, and we can, we, when we are shown a pen, into, uh, it, it gets into a nearly automatic association of that word to uh, the associated object and its, uh, its functions. So speaking about, uh, 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 speaking uh, uh, and language may have something to do also with a special kind of learning, which uh, takes uh, us from having to make conscious associations in order to act to uh, a nearly automatic or automatic pilot way. Um, of course, mind, uh, language, and reality are deeply interconnected, and, and there's been several intellectuals and philosophers that have studied this, and also several scientists, uh, from Nelson Goodman, Bill and Flusser, that provide an approach to a theory of symbols using text, images, scores, uh, uh, both uh, uh, as language but also as semantic signifiers. Um, or, for example, Walter Ong, who has also studied the relation between orality, literacy, and technology. So, um, 
in a way, writing, which is a sophisticated version of, of, of language, uh, has uh, been the main way of, of human communication for the last 6,000 years, including the way in which computers today support many of its processes. In the case of, 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 of the work of, of, of uh, Harun and, and, and Jack, which, which also examine language, here um, it's interesting because I think that um, when, when we are talking about uh, language, we describe also this uh, uh, fundamental um, uh, uh, way in which we, within physics we use mathematics. And um, here, um, Maybe interest. Maybe it's interesting. I was talking uh, with a friend right now, some 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 minutes ago, and and uh, in a way, it becomes a, a bit of an epistemological paradox when we talk about uh, mathematics. And uh, there are a couple of interesting quotes. One of from Einstein, where he said uh, how, uh, and I'm just quoting him. Uh, how can it be that mathematics, being after all a product of human thought which is independent of experience, is so admirably appropriate to the objects of reality. And this epistemological paradox between mathematics and uh, other disciplines becomes even strikingly more vivid in the, in the words of Richard, Richard Feynman, uh, with uh, which uh, he uh, was uh, concerned about a, a remarkable relationship between mathematics and physics and, and said, Mathematics is not a science from our point of view in the sense that it is not a natural science. The test of its validity is not an experiment. Um, so in a, in a way, uh, we know on, on, the, on, on, on the fundamental laws of the universe as the ones that, uh, that are being studied at CERN, the, the, the less the real world makes sense um, the, the, the less the, the real world makes sense to us uh, in a way, because of all these uh, ways um, uh, in which um, there, uh, in which um, mathematics and other types of languages are used, uh, and in a way, sometimes we may say, and it's in the case of the work of, of Harun and, and Jack. It's kind of it's a kind of nonsense if if we took it from a, a different stance. For example, if we take it two thousand years from now. So these these are these are very interesting aspects. Even in the case of the work of Yu Cheng Wang, for example, she also in one of her of the layers of of her work when she uses a sound, she in a moment she reads on a a, a, a scientific paper. And once more, when you read a scientific paper itself, it's already nonsense because many scientific papers are not meant to be spoken. They require another type of reading, perhaps reading, their, reading them by sitting next to the paper and reproducing some of the theories that uh, may prove uh, to, um, to uh, be valid or not. In the case, for example, of Susan Trister, in, in, in also in the second floor, it's interesting when she spots uh, the interviews uh, of, with the scientists, and there is a type of language that the scientists use in order to explain a theory. But whenever they go into uh, the, 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 the realm of, of the image, it's a completely different uh, type of, 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 of explanation. So once more, this has to do, and, and not, as, as I was saying before, Nelson Goodman has studied this a lot, there are all these different uh, uh, s symbolic elements depending on, on the type of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, symbolic uh, uh, use, either it's image, either it's uh, a text or, 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 or scores or sounds or, or codifications. Um, then I, I, want to, I want to move a little bit um, to the space, to jump a little bit to the world of abstraction and in particular uh, to the work of Diane who also uses scientific theory of, of space and time in order to produce questions in a, in a way as a sort of, of, of a manifesto in which um, she's uh, urging for humans to gain a better glimpse of abstraction as means to understand the impact of certain scientific uh, phenomena in, in the world. And this is even more, um, more acute, uh, and I want to finish um, there, uh, with, with the work of Leah. Uh, Leah Porsager, who um, 
uses uh, spiritualism as an attempt to uh, practice metaphysics uh, through scientific means and to prove the existence of a world uh, beyond. So I want to uh, be, um, I, want, I, ha I have some very specific questions that perhaps could generate a little bit of a, of a discussion here. Uh, the first is for Harun. Harun, you mentioned uh, once while, while we were talking uh, about your readings on McLuhan, in particular uh, his book, uh, The Mechanical Bride, who, who was also, you were also uh, quite fascinated about, uh, about the subject and, and uh, that McLuhan popularized the idea of language being a technology or an extension of, of, uh, an extension, uh, of, of man. Uh, that essentially separates how reality is perceived into the distinct senses of seeing and hearing. Can you tell us a bit more about this and how it is impregnated in, in, in your work, in, your, in the piece that, that you presented with Jack? Yeah, sure. Um, it's funny that you bring up the mechanical bride, actually, because... Uh, is, this, is this working? Yeah. Because... Um, oh, right. Well... <laughs> Um, the guy that actually handed me that book 20 years ago sat in the audience, Nathan, <laughs> uh, in Winchester. He, well, I was about to embark on writing my uh, dissertation, I guess, and he was like, he gave me a bunch of books, and that was one of them, uh, along with Baudrillard and some other stuff. I can't remember if you remember Nathan, what he, he gave me, but um, I think the thing that I took uh, out of McLuhan, because uh, I was interested in acoustic space, uh, particularly his essay on... That's the thing that really I gravitated towards. Um, uh, and he saw acoustic space as... You know, he was talking about media, obviously. He was talking about media technologies and how uh, they disseminate throughout uh, the world and, and, and how people perceive them. Um, so there was two sides of it. One was just the pragmatics of acoustic space and how acoustic spaces differs from visual space but the other was this sort of deeper philosophical side of um, uh, acoustic space and language and how language is an acoustic you know it, it was an acoustic thing in the first place before Gutenberg before the uh, you know the mechanical bride which is what he's talking about when he when it, which is the reference is Gutenberg and the printed text um, he talks about how visual space and acoustic space separate so as soon as, like you were saying about the pen, you know, you say the word pen, and as soon as you say that word, you know what that instrument is. You know, you think of a, of a pen. Um, <clears throat> so before that moment, it was just the object, the pen, and the experience of the object was both acoustic and visual simultaneously. And with language, there was a sort of a bifurcation. It's split, you know, and that's when acoustic space and visual space somehow... Uh, separated in terms of perception. So that's what he argues, basically, with this essay, uh, or a, a, a number of essays that he wrote about visual and acoustic space. Uh, and I guess that was my um, sort of main interest. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, other parts of McLuhan that I find sort of interesting that are probably irrelevant to this piece as well. But I think that's the main thing, really, this kind of... And then he talks about with printed, you know, with, with uh, Gutenberg, you then have another... S separation. So, you know, so the word pen is not the thing itself, it's an abstraction, it's a phonetic, it's an acoustic abstraction of the thing. So it's a representation of this thing that you can experience. And the sound pen isn't, uh, isn't the thing itself, it's, an, uh, it's a representation. So that's one level, of rep one level of abstraction. But then when you write the word pen with syntax, that's bringing it back into visual space you know, a, 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 a graphic into graphic form, uh, which is which is a which is an abstraction of the sound. I mean, this is only in west in the west. It's yes. not in the east where they have you know where there's characters. So that's slightly different. But you have two levels of abstraction from the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, somehow in in this sort of more contemporary situation where uh, we so so. Because of this, perhaps the visual became more important somehow. So we became an ocular-centric yes. society in the West, um, and because of what's happening now with uh, media and how media is transformed, and it's become more than just things that we see. Um, there's a sort of uh, there's more of a balance in, tim in terms of the visual and acoustic, and that's the thing that interests me. So in you, terms you, you are trying to integrate back. 
Well, I mean, those, it, yeah, within my work, I guess, inputs, yeah. yeah, I guess within what I've been doing for the last 20 years, I guess, is, is this kind of thinking about uh, um, perception as a, as a, as a uh, um, you know, not just these separate things uh, dependent on certain, certain parts of the physiology, but mm. more of a uh, whole. Mm. Jack. There are four distinct uh, texts present in, in, in the piece, uh, one to one. Uh, one is uh, spoken by Jess. One on one. One on one. One to one, one is one. an old mobile phone company <laughs> from the 90s. <laughs> yes, one 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 one. One, yeah. One. Yeah. One, one, one. one. One is the, the, the spoken is spoken by Jess, the other one by the avatar, and the two that appear as, as writing at the top. Yeah. Uh, but each was produced with a combination of uh, conventional uh, authoring uh, and algorithmic processes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because obviously when we get there and we try to, uh, at the first time that you sent me the video, I was trying to understand something, and I, w I was I was I was feeling that I either I was a stupid or I I, I there was was something that was a, a mistake that I couldn't make sense of anything, uh, <laughs> and 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 then then you explain me very with a lot of detail about this, but if you can uh, explain us uh, also, I mean. Not just the processes, but why did you came across this this yeah, type the of rationale yeah, the rationale? Yeah, the rationale of that language. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, I mean, you should kind of know that the basic structure, the kind of physical setup of this piece, is it's got eight eight uh, channels of electrical signals, which are going to eight speakers, and also going to um, uh, eight strips of LEDs, which is something that Harun uses a lot in his practice, and there's also a single video screen. So the text that you're referring to is on the video. So yeah, there's four uh, distinct texts. So two of them are being spoken. Uh, one of them is being spoken by our friend Jess, who's you know a human, so she's just a real, <laughs> a real person. There's also a, um, a CGI avatar um, who is speak who um, it's an avatar of Jess that we made with some free uh, software. She's speaking um, another text, and her voice is actually from a Google kind of speech synthesizer. And then there's two, uh, sort of a third and a fourth text that appear as subtitles, um, <clears throat> but they they kind of they kind of behave at least at the beginning like subtitles, and that they're kind of synchronized to to what's being spoken, but they're different words. And uh, the way that they were produced, so. There was a mixture, like you said, uh, Jose Carlos, of um, conventional kind of authoring. And then at certain points, they got kind of mangled by um, various kind of algorithms. So sort of various simple. Uh, so, well, I mean, I'll just explain it. So the first piece, the first text was um, something that I wrote that was kind of based on some ideas that we had at CERN about archaeology and sort of digging down through the kind of surface kind of level of reality. Uh, and also just literally digging into the ground and finding old bits of kind the of bins. Parts. Yeah, going through the bins, which is what we did a lot at CERN. We kind of went through there. They've got the best bins in the world, <laughs> if you're into like kind of old bits of circuit board and stuff. So, um, and I then got that text. It was kind of, it was just a bit of a kind of, you know, a bit of a kind of poem. And then I just repeatedly Google translated it till it had kind of become sort of like concrete poetry, really. Um, just sort of, uh, it became really interesting, slightly nonsensical, but kind of evocative, because it had come from, you know, source material. It wasn't nonsense to begin with. Uh, then um, the other spoken text that the avatars reading was made by, um, I made a list of about 300 words that were just random words that I liked that just kind of came up spontaneously. It was just kind of like bridge, sale, because, you know, just this big list. And then with, the, with each of those words, I used them as the first word. I basically typed them into my phone and then used the uh, predictive text on my phone, going in a certain kind of pattern of its suggestions. So, so, I didn't, so I wasn't kind of able to influence it to make it say things that I liked. That produced 310 word sentences. And I then went through and selectively picked the ones that I liked and arranged them so that they had the kind of structure of uh, a magical invocation, basically. So they're sort of like. Um, I had in mind um, sort of uh, your higher self or your kind of holy guardian angel or something sort of contacting you or a kind of very futuristic human 
trying to contact us back in the past. But because it was done by my phone, it keeps descending into kind of talking about email and sort of saying, <laughs> yeah, best, best regards and things. <laughs> and then uh, the other two texts, uh, the, so the subtitle text, one of them was a poem that, again, I just Google translated, and it just appears on the screen kind of verbatim. And then the fourth one is the first two chapters of the Tao Te Ching, which is the um, Chinese book of Taoism. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is kind of yin and yang, uh, the kind of whole Chinese ancient philosophy. And uh, the first two chapters of it deal specifically with the relationship between language and the world. So the very first line of it is, um, the Tao that can be expressed is not the eternal Tao. So it's immediately pointing at the kind of the limitations that there are of language. And I got that, and uh, I got the Google um, speech-to-text app on my phone and just read it really fast, <clears throat> so it couldn't keep up. And so it just completely garbled it. <clears throat> uh, but again, in, in a kind of way that felt quite nice and poetic. So those are the texts. And I guess part of the rationale for doing it was that, you know, it's, I think, generally when doing art, at least the kind of work I, that I've been doing with Haroon, it's kind of nice to just not have too much of a controlling hand on what's going on and be open to just accidents and chance and things that sort of, um, you know, undercut your original idea, but in a way that kind of makes it more interesting. So that was kind of one, that was the sort of initial, just instinctive reason for doing it. But in fact, there is, you know, Haroon and I have, this work has come out of a long conversation that was going on a long time before we went to CERN around questions of consciousness and the relationship between conscious experience and physical reality, kind of matter. And there's something interesting about these really stupid Google algorithms, because they are sort of, you know, they may not be conscious in the way that we are, but they are, they do have a kind of type of intelligence. And the realm that they inhabit is this purely kind of cyberspace type realm. So one of the things that we did and didn't end up using in the end was we, um, got a, uh, an online article generator, so something that writes news articles, and got it to write an article on quantum gravity. And it basically, if you didn't know, if you didn't know physics, you'd just think, ah, oh, this is a physics paper. And it's just, I mean, it's gibberish, but it's really good physics gibberish. <laughs> and, uh, but that was the only things that it had to refer to, that online generator, is it just does a search on the internet and finds things so and finds things and, and assimilates it so that, you know it's living in this realm where all of its kind of sensory inputs are totally virtual and so it kind of you know it's a nice way of thinking about the relationship between matter you know all these things are just running on digital you know hardware somewhere they're totally material and yet they're kind of abstract at the same time so it was a nice way of tying these things together uh Diane, um moving on to your work uh, um your work is, in a way, based on discussions of notions of space and, and time and how our immediate reality is completely exotic from, from today's fundamental size. But um, you use a lot of graphics and animations uh, and also text. And I, I was wondering how does these different notations uh, in, in your work um, uh, work as a common as a common result? Also. In connection afterwards with with, with sound, uh, and that's something more specific. Also, perhaps Seth can can also um, 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 uh, mention something around this um, uh, way in which uh, music um, is uh, produced and operates. Uh, we were talking um, uh, uh, some some minutes ago with Seth about how music could become a sort of a, a psycho a psychoactive. Uh, uh, change or uh, activator. Um, well, I, I'm the the question is sort of why 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 the shapes or what what's what's uh, the importance of abstraction? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because they're, they're quite different. They're, they're 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 very different lines. I mean, one is one is like a, a formalism, and it, um, in a way is, is is sort of less less meaty, I suppose. Than, than the question of abstraction more, more broadly. Um, I don't know. I mean... Either. W whatever you... <laughs> I, I mean, what, what is interesting, I think, is the combination of all these different types of graphics and texts to generate this type of per perception of, 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 of vertigo or... Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I mean, that it's consolidated within also the, 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 the sound. Mm -hmm. 
because basically that's an abstraction. I mean, you're, you're using formal um, no notations in order to produce an abstraction. I suppose. I mean, I, I think my, my interest in abstraction is, I mean, it's, it's sort of at the, at the heart of all the work done at CERN. It's at the heart of, um, I mean, we, we wouldn't sort of be where we are as a species without it. I mean, that's sort of, um, I suppose, my interest in it. And I think um, with the video specifically, having... It's 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 uh, my, I have an interest in sort of pushing the capa the capacities of what the human can can do. Uh, so I mean it's it's a very small example of sort of giving you too much information at once. So I mean that's the, sort of the experience of of the visual within it, um, and I suppose the audio as well actually is more than you can sort of take at once. Um, I mean, but but my my interest in abstraction is sort of beyond that really. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in uh, yeah, I suppose the, li the limits of the human. Um, perception. Well, uh, yeah, yes, perception, but not just, not just I mean, I, I suppose recognizing that our limits of perception are very limit, are, are, are slim, uh, and that we exist in a very specific scale that is, feels like reality, but actually there's these other scales that happen that are completely inaccessible mm -hmm. to us on a daily basis, um, but fundamentally make up the world that we live in. And, and you know, it, it's funny, a question came up earlier around CERN and um, the, the I, I understood it to be vaguely about climate and the future and how does CERN sort of deal with that. And I think one of the things I'm interested in particularly around this is um, the our capacity, uh, the, the the capacity that we have as a species to understand uh, the extremes of scale that we can now uh, is is relatively recent. You know, it's 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 only a you know, hundred, couple hundred years that we we've sort of had access to this this stuff, even as ideas. And and I think, or my hope, I suppose, is that this is this is uh, an instigation of a a, a grand emotion. <coughs> Of, of us as a species, and I think CERN can contribute to that because it, it sort of normalizes this this um, uh, ability to uh, this this capacity to access things that are that are outside of experience. So it's, it's I'm, I'm quite interested in this difference between um, being able to know something not through experience. So you you experience one thing and you know another, but both things exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I mean I think the video does this, but I think it sort of it's a, it's a bit of a, of a, of a rabbit hole. <laughs> um. So many threads to this conversation. I'm just trying to organize my thinking a little bit. Um, just to respond, I mean, this idea of scale and the, this question between auditory and visual channels, probably worth unpicking a little bit because Dan and I had a lot of conversations about the, the privileging, the, the historic privileging of the, uh, of the visual, which Jonathan Stern talks yeah. about in relation to um, back to Aristotle, et cetera, you know, seeing is believing, et cetera. And I have a certain kind of polemical stance against that, as you might not be surprised as a sound artist, but also as someone whose background is in neurosciences, so, um, and this question of language. So I think what the, the shared understanding, I think, that Diane and I were talking about was almost a triadic relationship between the auditory, the visual, and the conceptual, and not, you know, a, a, the, the, the conceptual operating through both the visual graphic structures that, that Diane develops, but also sound and these questions of scale. So I think the particular thing, for at least f from my end, that I was interested in was um, the way in which a single pattern can operate over different time frames simultaneously, so, and, and the limits, that, or, the, or the way that that pushes at the perceptual categorical limits that we, that, that we that, you know, phenomenally perceive. So there's something, for example, about how a very, you know, a single pattern presented over microseconds, you know, is perceived as a click, even though within a single click with it, that you'll hear here, there's, there's a huge amount of detail, but it's just beyond what can be heard. You take the same pattern, you apply it over seconds, and you start hearing spatialized, maybe bass sounds, and you apply it over um, a millennia, and maybe we get to a black hole or something. I don't know, the, you know, the, <laughs> the, great, the great B flat of the universe or wh wh wherever we're at with that. But these questions of scale and these questions of limit, of, of human limit, and the way that... Um, these operate, I think, is very, very interesting. I think is probably fundamental. I think to to the work. Um. It's a part of our um, 
limitation though, isn't it? Human yeah. limitation. Yeah. That's the resolution that we can see. That's the resolution that we can hear. It's about the scale. You know, you're talking about what we can, you, we can look into different scales, but it's not really part of our everyday. But, it, but it's not outside of our capacity. I guess that's, outside that's, of our capacity that's, I mean, that's the thing that interests me is that we, we, we do have this capacity for abstraction, mm. you know, and that's, it's exemplified by, I mean, fantastically well through, through science, but through, through art as well. Let me just pick up on this earlier question about sort of art science, because I think maybe that's part of what we're thinking about is the, it's, it's something that, um, the, there's a, a science historian, a microbiologist called uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger, who talks about um, both being concerned with the generation of new epistemic things. So there's a kind of experimental method um, by which both arts and science can be concerned with the generation of new knowledge in different ways. Um, and but particularly, you know, the assembling of materials, the assembling of processes, harnessing them to try and push it the limits that we were hearing about earlier in, in a variety of ways are coming at it from a variety of different perspectives, which I think is is probably opens up a more speculative stance mm -hmm. towards, you know, what might be possible in terms of work, but also in terms of what scientists are thinking about. So I think there are lots of commonalities there. I mean, I do think that some of the descriptions earlier of scientific practice feels exactly like studio practice, you know, and sort of have it, having a hunch and following it and ending up potentially somewhere. Um, other than, than you originally intended. I mean, I think in this piece, it, it very much started about thinking about the difference between temporality and time. So um, t time as it exists in physics and that it can go in either direction and that's perfectly fine and doesn't violate anything, but it's so contrary to the experience of temporality as unidirectional and, and this sort of thing. And, and while that is still very much in there, by the end of, by the time the piece came together, it sort of, it, it ends up being, Introducing ideas of like, well, maybe like the the meat we're in just doesn't have the capacity to understand time. We we're, we we're not up to it. I mean, time is exemplary of a lot of other things. I mean, we just don't have the capacity as a species to fully understand what the actual fabric of the universe is. We we have limits, but potentially collaborations with machines. So not just mach machines like CERN, like the large hydro the LHC, but artificial intelligence and perhaps through these sort of collaborations we might be able to develop a more adequate um, or, or, or more adequate capacities to understand mm. how time actually functions because mm. we're, we're so uh, it, it's so our, our, our understanding of reality can be very determined by our experience and it's very very hard to get out of um, the the notion that time flows Monica I just want to uh, conclude asking you something that I, I always, always, uh, I, I always, uh, uh, in a way, admire you for that. But it's also a challenge. I mean, when you get a proposal from, 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 um, or you get uh, a ser series of proposals from from the artists that uh, that would like to apply to CERN. I mean, there there is always an abstract language in what in what in what they 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 they, they propose, and you have to, in a way, translate that into. Okay, uh, they will meet with these artists, with these scientists, with these other scientists. So, in a way, it's also a, 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 an effort of translating from one type of abstraction to something that it's more uh, closer to the different practices at, at CERN. How challenging has it this been? Because it's 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 a curatorial, it's a constant curatorial uh, job within within the lab. Yeah, uh, that's a very nice question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because I keep thinking myself about how to improve it and enhance the way we do it. But, um, you know, listening to you, I, I was thinking about these uh, sailors, the, the colonizers of the hidden walls when uh, the oceans were not connected and people had to navigate to Terra Incognita and find the Cabo Hornos and cross from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And they were scared to just fall from the world to a unknown place. I think sometimes uh, we need to set ourselves this challenge, right? And uh, and uh, I think we try to do it. When I have a proposal, and um, I know many people know many things that we can share uh, from both sides, the people who come and the people who 
stays there for 20 years, but also the people who come for three days, they have an intuition and a way to, to, to phrase and, uh, and try to imagine this, this unknown place that they want to feel with some experience and knowledge. So my only, um, my only reaction to that is that uh, can we provide this uh, structure to, to where uh, each uh, person's skill can negotiate and can feel with experiences that uh, might be unique. Um, we have so much to offer. And uh, sometimes I see myself with this bad habit of, of going to exhibitions and thinking, what can we offer to this artist at CERN? And there are many things that I keep thinking, yeah, we could add this l layer to it because there are many, there are many layers. Uh, we are just naming a few, complexity, precision, language is a continuous uh, framework for discovery. But uh, uh, yeah, maybe we, we need to, I keep thinking that CERN, there are many CERNs. We, as curators, keep looking for models of uh, providing opportunities for new artistic practices. Uh, so yeah, uh, you just need to react with your own expertise and how you can negotiate it, right? How you can sail through this places and uh, without getting too scared. The other day, Leslie Thornton, an artist who uh, I'm, I'm working with at CERN, she said that uh, by coming to these environments, uh, uh, she realized uh, her position as artist, uh, as someone who is looking for new spaces for research, abstract spaces that you need to, to look for every day as an artist, because you are investigating the boundaries. And I thought it was really nice. And uh, then she add that uh, while well, she is uh, 68, around 68, I didn't ask, but I, <laughs> I think she is about this generation. And she said, you know, when I was in art school and later, we kept talking to each other, to each other. the artists, we were a community. And now we are just sailors. We are looking for these spaces. So I think it's, yeah, we just need to make the service. <laughs> Okay, any questions for our panel? Really? <laughs> That's good. Excellent. It's getting late in the day. I wanted a bit of time to sort of have a little think there. Um, it's about meaning, really, and so we've been talking about language, uh, and there's obviously, it, Jack, in the way you're explaining with these sort of poems, kind of random text, I suppose the idea is that some meaning, there's some meaningfulness comes about in it. Yeah. And we were talking before, uh, talking before in the panel, in the panel before about um, CERN's kind of use, uh, like what use is it in the uh, climate situation we're in, mm. and I wonder about uh, the sort of if it's the role of culture and art in general to sort of provide that sort of well, just provide like the bottom line of meaning to what's actually happening at CERN. That's not about just uh, sort of theories and uh, use, you know, uses and use upon use and like where where it's going and maybe art does that. Like, is that its role? And did you feel that that was your role to find meaning? Well, I mean, you know, I had this interesting conversation at CERN with uh, a physicist called John Ellis, who's a bit of a kind of CERN legend, uh, who's been there for, I don't know, Monica, how long has John Ellis been there for? Uh, his entire life. I his think. entire life. <laughs> He's born there. He's actually formed in an experiment. And, um, <laughs> but he said to me, uh, like, the more that... Uh, um, he understands about his work, the more he realizes that there's less meaning to the universe. So, you know, like meaning is a human construct. You know, there's out, you know, beyond kind of consciousness, there's just physical stuff 
following whatever kind of laws it happens to follow. So meaning is, you know, something that only really exists in this realm that we all live in, because, you know, we don't really live in physical reality. Physical reality is a very long way away from, from you know, what we're kind of in. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And then, so this, I mean, at least with the work uh, that we're showing in this, in this show, uh, it is partly an attempt, it is kind of an experiment to actually, you know, find where the limit is between something being meaningful and being meaningless. Or you could also kind of, if you wanted to, you could view it from a different angle and it could be the point at which um, the uh, language and the physical world uh, you know, meet, and in the end, you know, language, uh, you know, it become, can become rendered useless in the face of the kind of what the actual, actual physical world is like, you know. Um, Terence McKenna, the psychedelics researcher, once said that um, he was describing the psychedelic experience, and he said that um, the trouble with trying to describe it in words is that words fall off it like water off a duck's back. And I think that's true for just, you know, everything that we perceive, you know, you couldn't, you know, you could it would take an infinite number of words just to describe what's happening right now. So yeah, you know, we're, uh, I think, um, you know, I think art, I mean, art can explore whatever it wants to, but I think the question of where the edge of meaning lies is a really fertile one. At least it has been for the work that we've been doing. Can, can I add something to that? Because I think there's maybe a connection with the question about randomness earlier. I mean, in the neurosciences, the phenomena of what's called apophenic perception is is well known. So essentially, I think it touches on maybe what the phys physicists were talking about, that you know, we're, we're, we're narrating primates that are very good at picking out, or making up stories about patterns. Uh, whether those stories are real or not then leads to a question about objectivity, subjectivity, all of that. And I think there's this real issue about how um, we tend to you know, superpose and project meaning into that which is essentially meaning, <coughs> meaningless in a strictly technical way. I'd be kind of interested to know what the physicists make. Yeah, I mean, like pattern seeking, the, yeah. uh, is meaning is like an artifact of pattern seeking Almost, in a way. Yeah, from so that's, I mean, that's kind of a, th a few things. You know, we've talked about that a number of times, you know, in a way, yeah. I guess your question is about, you know, who provides meaning and everyone's looking for meaning. But when you look at the sort of mechanics of, of looking for meaning, it's almost pattern seeking. Um, and that's the kind of... Uh, but but then that's an abstraction in itself, so. It also ties to that quote, Jose Carlos, you said at the beginning about uh, Einstein, was it, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's sort of talking about the kind of why, why is math so kind of, it seems quite unreasonable that it's so successful in describing the world. And one of the things that we spoke, we, so one of the things we did at CERN was talk to a lot of theorists about the kind of role of uh, maths and you know, why does maths work to describe the world? And is it that the world is actually made out of kind of language, you know, mathematics? Or does, is you know, the world just out there being physical stuff and maths is a kind of artifact of it? And you know, through these kind of conversations, I kind of was led to start thinking that actually, you know, we are pattern seeking beings. And uh, like Seth said, you know, if, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if you live in an ordered world, where the sun goes down and then it comes up again, or you know you drop things and they fall to the floor, then you start kind of spotting this kind of order, and then if you kind of so you know where you can kind of build in some kind of cognitive sense this kind of picture of of order, and then you can use the kind of gift of abstraction to actually start turning that into mathematics. Time. Yeah, or you know so really it's kind of but when you view it like that, it stops being so surprising that maths works to describe the universe because. Maths is somehow derived from just the fact that there is some order to the universe, at least the universe that we kind of live in day to day, and we can abstract. So it kind of makes sense that you know we should then be able to mirror where it came from in the first place using maths. Nice. I love the fact, Jack, that you changed that Einstein quote from admirable to unreasonable. Yeah. Oh, well, it's actually... Big, was, there's a famous quote by Eugene Wigner. There, Eugene Wigner was a scientist, and he is probably Wigner. And uh, he wrote an essay called um, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. So that's why I kind of nicked that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else got a question? I'm going to start thrusting it in your hand if people don't put their hands <laughs> in. No? Okay. Um, I, I had a thought whilst we were... Um, going through these panels 
in relation to the idea of this mirror world where 11,000 artists were funded <laughs> and supported to live in a so concrete building somewhere on the border of France and Switzerland to answer the questions of the universe and who we are, occasionally accepting scientists in to, to you know, <laughs> explain our ideas with crazy facts um, and just what kind of a world that would be. And maybe this exhibition is some sort of a window into that world. So maybe let's leave it there. Thank you very much to the panel.